Well, let's continue the everlasting. Let's go to Psalms 25. Let's let's look at some of the stuff that David that David got into, and, and we are only going to touch just a small amount here because, well, I'm going to tell you something about David. He was something else. The apple of God's eye. Hmm? And you know, I think I think he's a perfect example. Do you realize that if if David lived in our day, what we would have done to him as soon as the word got out that he had Uriah put to death so he could have Bathsheba for a wife? Well, it got quiet now, didn't it? The old judgment machine would have begun. Oh, oh, God will never use him. That's the end of David's time. Well, he might as well retire and get back out in the back 40 because God will never use that now. Well, I'll never listen to nothing David's got to say again. Well, I mean, I put him up on that pedestal, obviously, and now he's been knocked off. And, and it goes on, it goes on, it goes on, it goes on. And here's the same guy that had Uriah put in the heat of the battle on the front line so he could be killed, so he could have the beautiful Bathsheba, the apple of God's eye. The anointed of the Lord Himself. The purpose and the intent of the heart is what God judges. You know what you and I judge? Right here. What we can see and what we can hear. And God help every one of us the way that we have done it. Because it is a detriment to us, to our children, and to our grandchildren. And yet nobody wants to stand up. See, the thing that I kept saying to, to young ministers, I said, you have got to preach against sin. And do you know what kept coming back after those young ministers would go out and preach? Boy, they don't like that. I was told I can't come back unless I want to bring a faith message and not be hitting people over the head about sin. You know why? Church is interested in the money and the building of whatever these things are called temples to be and they're not interested in seeing you grow up and being blessed. If they were, they would have let us come in. They would let prophets like me absolutely shear the sheep. That's what I say, pastors, they'll come back and put the salve all over you and you'll be okay. The prophets are going to come in and shear you. When I go into a place that I've never been in before, God help the pastor and everybody in the room. And I don't want the pastor telling me anything about him, his wife, his kids, the next door neighbor, or the people down the street. I'm going to fast, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to come in there and clean house, and that's all there is to it. When I get done, if they want me back, that's fine. If they don't, well, bless God, I'll knock the dust off the heels of my feet when I go out the door and let the whole thing fall to the ground. It's a dangerous thing to bring a real prophet into the room. It's a dangerous thing to commit yourself to come sit under a real prophet. Why? Because we're going to see to it you grow up. See, I didn't take any of you to raise, and some of you, bless God, sitting out here think I did, and I want to tell you something, I didn't. I didn't take you to raise. You're not going to be my best buddy. I don't have best buddies. Oh yeah, I do. She's sitting right up there. Sorry about that, best buddy. You said, well, that don't sound real kind. I don't want it to sound kind. This is life and it's death. It's blessings and it's cursing. It's got nothing to do with me and you going fishing. Well, I don't think I like that. Get over it. Because you like the life that I preach. The death that I can take it to. And I will give that to you. Not, not, not just give it to you so that, bless God, you can take it home and play with it, but I'll give it to you so you can take it home and put it to work and it begin to work into your life, into your families. And then, bless God, you can stand and say, Yea, unto the Lord our God of all of Israel. Now, and I didn't tell you where Psalm 25, did I give you that part? I praise God anyway. Now listen, the 10th verse. The 10th verse. 25.10. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep His co covenant and His testimonies. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep His covenant and His testimonies. Isn't that something? All the paths of the Lord are mercy. So there's going to be mercy there. And there's also going to be the truth of the living God that's going to prevail. Let's look in the 14th verse. It says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He will show them His cut of His covenant. Now, you want to know the key to Him showing you the covenant? You know why God is showing you this covenant? To each one of you in this room? Right here. It says, the, Lord, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. 
That's the secret. You, you, you in this room, somewhere along the line, begin to fear God. And now that you have, He is going to show them His covenant. And what I'm doing as His prophet is I am presenting to you the covenant, the everlasting covenant that was given to a thousand generations that He said, I will never break my covenant unto you. I am now revealing to you something that, that somehow has been tucked away, somehow has been hid, somehow has been, through deception, kept from you. But why did it happen? Because you first feared Him. See, that's the reason there's a bonding between you and I. There's something different in this movement of God than, than, than I saw within the Pentecostals, within the Charismatics. And it's a bonding. It's a bonding that goes far beyond, oh, how are you doing? And the bonding is we are of the same spirit and mostly of the same mind. That we have come through a lot of the things that we've come, we've all come through similar types of things together. Most of us in the room, like I said, we've always been those, those people going around and acting as though they couldn't put a, a you know, a, 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 a round peg in a square hole. We never fit. We always seem to be saying, well, why would that be, Pastor? And Pastor's saying, oh, shut out. Shut up and sit down, dummy. You girls know something about this. <laughs> You don't, you don't know anything. I'm the pastor, and after all, at the school of righteousness, this is the way they told us it is. Amen? See, see, and we have all, we've been there. And finally, we begin to fear God. But you know something? That type of fear was in, 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 in bless God, uh, in, in Martin Luther. That type of fear was in the Wesley brothers. That, that, that type of fear, bless God, is in us today. It isn't. It isn't that we want to go out here and make a big wave and, and say, well, we'll show you. No, no. We just want to, we just want to get in position that there'll come a day in which we all will give up the ghost. We'll stand before the Lord God and He'll say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That's where we've come to. We're not into building uh, uh, temples. I know that some of you, uh, maybe not, I shouldn't say you, there have been people that have been uh, kind of disappointed when I said, we're not going to build churches. We're going to have fellowships. Try to keep them down somewhere around 30. If they get up around 50 and we don't have somebody to teach to break it off, then we'll let it stay 50 for a while. Then we're going to break it off. Everybody's going to get a chance to minister that feels like they've got ministry in their life. We want, we want your gifting. You understand what I'm telling you? We want your gifting to work for us. And that's something you never have heard from the church. We can do that if we will love each other, quit judging each other, and quit sowing discord. <laughs> we can get those right, folks. I think the rest of this thing will be a piece of cake. Somebody said to me, so, well, just how are we going to deal with that? I said, well, we can do it the easy way, or we can do it the hard way. See, this old prophet is very capable of walking down this aisle this afternoon and looking at each of you, as I would like to say between your beady little eyes, but I won't say that. And say unto you, thus saith the mouth of God. How embarrassing did that get? You're looking at the man that knows. I've been in those places. I've said unto the prophet. And I can tell you one thing. You can do it the easy way, or we'll do it the hard way. It doesn't matter to me. If it's going to take me walking out here and stopping and standing you up and telling you, you get that out of your life, or don't you bother coming back down here the next quarter, you're going to hear that come out of the mouth of this prophet. This is not a game. Please leave here this weekend understanding this is the big time, really, oh golly gee, move of God. And we're not going to be tolerating in any way, shape, or form, as my grandmother used to say, a bunch of monkey shine. Okay? No monkey shine. We're not going to have any of it. So in the way, so in one way, you know, this, this can be, uh, maybe this can be something that will help you out. Maybe, maybe you'll say, well, now, you, I didn't do very good maybe the first, the first uh, six or eight weeks. Uh, now I'm going to have to work real hard because I've got to go down and see the prophet again here. And you know, I don't want to be the one when he stops by my, my row and looks at me and says, look, no, I think, I think I'll work on that. If that, if that. if that kind of fear has to come, let it come. Because there's the fear of God and there's the fear of the prophets. Okay? 
Believe the prophets and prosper. And that's what I want you to do. And I want you to understand, if you will believe me, you will prosper. I don't want you to, I don't want you to get to the place to think that, that bless God, that this is going to be a, one of those places every time you come that we're going to have kangaroo court and you're the kangaroo. That's not what we're going to do, all right? We're not going to do that. But what I want to say is, we have to get past certain things. We want to bring, folks, my, my goal is to be able to bring you in this room after we can get you into a little deeper fasting in three days. Bring you into this room and we can worship and praise the Lord God. Bring the Word. And bless God that that glory cloud will show up in this room. Now that glory cloud has been in this room one time. It has been right here, right where you sit. It's been here. The first time I ever saw the glory cloud was here in this room. There was a curtain that hung there. was working on this room. And we had services out in that room. The petitions back in the back there uh, as the, uh, uh, for the small children wasn't there. So the room was just open. And I always said, behind the Holy of Holies, and it was kind of a, a kind of a joking thing, and I would turn around and point to the, the curtain and call this the Holy of Holies, and everybody kind of chuckled. And, I, and one, so after Sunday night, and one Monday morning, I came back down here and we was going to do some work back here. And so I got down here about 9 o'clock, and the brother came out to the car to meet me, and I thought, well, that's kind of strange. And he said, uh, you better come with me. And I said, what's wrong? He said, well, nothing's wrong, but he said, there's something strange going on. I said, well... What boy, boy he told me, he said, well, come. So we came back through there and opened that curtain up, and there was a cloud that was just about knee-deep all over this, this floor. And you'd walk out in the middle of this room, I'd kick it, and it would start rolling like a ball. And I'm standing there going, what is this? There it goes, roll like a ball. And this guy said to me, he said, that's not fog. I said, no, no, uh, uh, no. Uh, I said, but maybe, you know, I'm trying to, in my own self, explain something away here because, you know, I mean, after all, if we were all together praying and all this happened, I could, I could accept that a whole lot better. We'd had a good service that night, uh, the night before in that room. I walked all over here, kicking it, and it just kept rolling. He said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to lay down right in the middle of that floor and I'm going to pray. I lay down, you couldn't even see me. And I laid down out there in the middle of that floor and I started crying out to God. I said, God, what means this? I said, what kind of a sign is this, Lord, unto thy servant? And the angel spoke unto me and the angel said unto me, he said, yea, this is the glory of God. This is the cloud that was seen by Moses himself. This is a cloud that entered into the temple. And he said, you will see this cloud throughout the years and the time of your ministry on this earth. I thought, dear God in heaven. How do you tell that to somebody that wouldn't have believed it anyway if they'd have been here? I kept my mouth shut about it for a long time. A few people knew, not very many. The second time it appeared, I was in, I was in, I was in, uh, bless God, in, uh, uh, the Philippines had a room full of ministers about this size. We went to praying. Now, in the spirit realm, often when I minister, the anointing gets heavy enough that in the spirit, I can't see the back of the room. And I know as, the, as that, that moves forward, I know that the anointing gets heavier, okay? And so the, the, it gets to be in times I can't see, but maybe the first three or four wall rows, but it's a spiritual thing. It's something between me and God. So I'm, I'm praying, and I'm standing there, and kind of walking back and forth, doing like I am now. And all of a sudden, I looked, and, and the cloud appeared in the back of the room. And the clouds come forward, and they come forward, and they come forward. And all of a sudden, I begin to see the people looking around. The ministers, and they begin to bat at it, and it begin to consume them. And that cloud, top of all of us, and it began to rain. Water covered the floor. Never seen anything like it. May never see anything like it again. Must have went on for a good half an hour, 45 minutes. The cloud left. Nobody could minister. All we could do is stay on our faces before God because we knew we had been visited by the Most High Himself. Folks, those days have to come back. And I know that they will come back.
but they're not going to come back to a bunch of milly, milly mouthed Christians, as I call them. The blessed God that can't understand whether they're in, they're out, they're somewhere in between this thing, that will absolutely come to God, to His covenant, and walk up right before Him. That's going to cause, that's going to cause. Can you imagine the people? I know I've had people say, boy, Brother Deckard, if you could just tell me that that cloud's going to appear, we'll get a stadium. We'll fill the thing up. I said, I've never known that cloud's going to appear. Never have I. That the picture that's on the website, that came out of a, off an island called Mauritius when that happened to me. And God saved my life through that, through that cloud. What's that about? It's God. Why does He do these things? It's a shadow of things to come. You know what mostly it is? I am the Lord thy God. He puts His approval. He puts His signet upon it. And He's doing that in our lives even now. Even even now, He's doing that. So you say, well, well will, that, will that happen? You bet that's going to happen again. Because we are the ones upon whom the ends are written, and it will be for us. But we're going to fear Him. And again, I'm not, you know, I think we've moved a long way up in this thing, because even, even at this point in time, like I said, we're here because we together have come to a place of saying, okay, He's not our best buddy. He's really God, and we're going to have to fear Him. We're going to have to fear the fact that if we're not, that's the reason that daily self examination of our hearts is important. And I, I as I said, I've got a, I've got a thing that uh, I don't know if I can get the whole weekend out of uh, about the heart, but uh, that's important. And we're going to, we're going to get to it. We're going to begin to give you some ideas about how to examine your heart and how to be certain that your heart stays right. If your heart will stay right, because that's what God is judging. Now, now listen to me. Did God judge David because of his flesh? Yes, he did. Because what? The, the first baby died, right? But did, did he, did he in fact also judge his heart? Sure. Did, did, did David really and, and with his heart believe that Uriah should die? Nah. I don't believe that at all. Because if he had of, David would never have fulfilled. Because that, again, is what God is judging. Now, that's deep. But we'll, we'll try to bring some explanation to that when we get to that, that series. Uh, Psalm 78. Psalm 78. The first verse, Psalm 78. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He hath done. For He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers and, and that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. See, that, that's one of the things that, 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 that we do, especially uh, on Shabbat. Now, we didn't do it, we didn't do it today uh, because of uh, not going through that service because it, it's a bit long. But what we do in that is we bring the Scriptures that talks about being sure that we do what? We teach our children the law. See, it's our place. It's your place as, as the father to make sure those children learn the things of the covenant. It's not the Sunday school teacher, all right. In fact, again, I know you've heard me say it. Uh, the Orthodox don't ha they don't have Sunday school. What they have is synagogue. And when that's over, the father finds the time during Shabbat, sets the children down, and teaches them. They will not entrust their children to your opinion. You see how strong that is. That, that, you see, that, that, then that's fulfillment. Seven first, that they might set their hope in God and not forget His works uh, of God, but keep His commandments. So there we have it. Keep His commandments. And might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The children of Ephraim, that's us, being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God. 
and refuse to walk in His law. Uh-oh. And folks, that is in time, prophetic as it can get. Ephraim, Ephraim, turn back his bow, forget, for, for, and forget his works and his wonders that he had showed them. He didn't keep the he didn't keep the covenant. Refused to walk in his law. Isn't that what we did in the church? Which is mostly, which is most of which is Ephraim. We didn't walk in that. No, no, we come over there. That's the old OLD. That's the Old Testament over there. Good for a few good stories and laughs. There's not many laughs in that book, is there? Where are the New Testament? New, N-E-W, O-L-D, new here. And we drove, listen, we drove the covenant far from the people. That's what we did in the church. Now, what do you think about the responsibility of that? Who do you think is responsible for that? the church. What do you think is going to happen on that day? There's going to be blood all over them. And they will have to answer. He said, but if they've been blinded, even if they've been blinded. Folks, I, you know, it's a dangerous thing to take it within your hands, a living God, and begin to assume that you know what He wants. Because once you take that awesome responsibility of trying to guide a group of people, whether it's one or it's or it's fifty thousand, you are responsible. And see, I'm one of those old boys that understands the responsibility, and I don't want it. See, I don't want the responsibility of knowing that it's my job this weekend to come to present to you something that the church long since let slip by. It's my place to represent God in this and be certain through the time that I spent seeking God with it that I don't leave anything out of this thing and that you get all of it, which means that I have been able to feed you from the top to the bottom of the anointing that's in this room, simply from the one that's the most scriptural to the one that doesn't know very much. I have to be certain that you all are covered. I don't like that responsibility. The reason I said, I don't need this stuff, God. Let me just go about my business, doing my thing and my way, and just don't, don't get me involved with this. But this is what God got me involved with. And, and, and you see, when God gets you involved, you're involved. And if I, and if I don't fulfill this, then I'm going to be judged by that. So I have to do the best job that I can do with you to be certain that we all get on the same page and we all understand this thing. Will we? You bet we will. Is it deep? Yes, it's deep. Now, when you walk away from here, and like I said, you're going to have to go through this thing three or four times to begin to... There's a lot of things you're going to pick up here. Uh, the retention span is small in all of us, and there's going to be a lot of things you're going to miss, and that's the reason you're going to need to go back and, and bless God uh, study it. Thirteen. I'm sorry, twelve. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, the field of Zon. He divided the sea. He, he caused them to pass through. He made the waters to stand as a heap. And in the daytime also, He led them with a cloud and all the night with a light of fire. And you know, it goes on down through here. And, and I mean, He just pretty well goes through it all. You know, where the 18th verse, and they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Man, <laughs> Isn't that just like we still are? Yeah. As long as everything's going okay for our flesh, we and God are doing fine. The minute that it doesn't, wah, 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 wah. We might as well die out here where we're at, out here in the desert, uh, Moses. You did a really bang-up job to get us here, but man, look at us now. You remember when the, when the line was drawn where Korah and, and, and his group decided they were going to come against Moses? Moses going well. And remember, Moses was said about him, he was the most meek man that ever walked the face of this earth. But boy, did he swing a big club. And I can imagine at that point in time when they drew, they were getting ready to draw and draw on this line, I just had a feeling that old Moses was saying, you know, boys and girls, I think I'll just check it to you 
And I think I'll go back over here where I came from. And I think I'll just spend the rest of my days there. And God, you can just pick some other sucker to lead this group any further. And I hope you bless them with a rock when you get them on around the corner out there. But no, 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 no. God said, draw the line. Take it on one side. All of a sudden, the earth begins to shake. Cor and his group and the animals and everything else went down the hole. Well, Moses, after all, I think you're doing a good job here, son. <laughs> huh? If you don't think we're not fickle, boy, I'll put that. But you know what? I have always said this, and I uh, recently here, over the last probably couple of years, especially in this way, I said, you know, one of the things is that I think is going to have to happen, that there's going to have to be some out-and-out -out demonstration. And I think the core of thing is part of what's probably going to have to happen. And that's not something that, that I want to see happen. There's going to have to be some kind of a means for people to do just what happened then. Oh, well, hey Moses, I thought you'd done a fine job. I don't know about the rest of them here. And I've said there's going to have to be some preachers, some people go to the dirt in order for everybody else to understand that this God means business here. God, li listen... Leadership is not something that anybody ever should strive for. Okay? I have always said, I don't make a very good hero. I wouldn't be a very good guy to have on the, on the TV screen uh, preaching every Sunday wherever with all the thousands of people. In fact, they probably would X-rate most of what I had to preach with the things that I said. All right? And the, the other thing of it is, I don't want to be a hero. I'm a loner. As I've said over and over, I don't even particularly like people. The crowds make me nervous. And when I go, and, I, and we'll go to the store, you know what? I, I sit out in the car. Nobody ever sees me in those stores. I sit out in the car. Somebody says, come in. No, I'll just sit here. What are you going to do? I'll read the Bible. I'll meditate, pray. I don't want to go anywhere. Now, you and I get along most of the time because we have something in common. See, my spirit can connect. And when my spirit can connect, then, then, then I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable with you. I love this. I love this because you're coming here to be with me. Now, when I get ready to go traveling again, you know something? We're going there and, and we're going to have the, our friends are going to be there, the people that we can be comfortable with, and then we're going to have those knuckleheads come in to, well, I got scripture to show you that's a false prophet. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sitting up here reading Spirit, I'm going, somebody ought to throw that one right out that back window back there. But I love this because this is different. And I couldn't, and, and I know Donna could tell you, I, I'm relaxed. Because I know that I'm, I'm not here to fight a spiritual battle, I'm here to feed you. And if you could see what I could see in the Spirit, you're like a big sponge. And you're just soaking it in like a sponge will soak in water. Just and as long as that happens, brothers and sisters, this prophet will be here, and I'll be standing here ministering to you as long as it takes. Because that is what it's about. Where there's hunger, there's going to be God. Where there's not hunger, God's never there. That's the reason I keep saying, you can, you can sing the old rugged cross every Sunday morning for six months, and it won't take very long with the old rugged cross, it's just going to be some words. As I said the first few times I heard, I sat and cried like a baby. But what, what is it? We go through it so much that, bless God, it becomes just another song. But well, we don't want this to become just another movement of God. I don't think we're going to have, a, have that uh, liberty to get that done. Okay, uh, let's, let, let's go on. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, 31. The wrath of God came upon them and slew the fatness of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel for all this they sinned still and believed not for His wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble. When he slew them, th then they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God. And they remembered that God was their rock, and the high God their Redeemer. Now, I, I, that's really interesting because it took him slaying them before they did what? Before they returned and inquired of him early. 
Why is it that we just can't stay on that beaten path? You know, everything that God did here, He did, as the Bible says, for an end example or an example to us to be, to be an indicator. But folks, if they had trouble staying on this, believe you me, that doesn't mean it's going to be any less difficult for us. But that's the reason if we will learn from their mistakes. And after all, that's what, that's what life is. It's learning from your past mistakes or their past mistakes and begin to realize there were some set things that God was saying here. He was saying, and, and as Joshua talked about, that he would seek him and meditate therein day and night. He would keep the word coming out of his mouth, and he would do those things. And then God said, and, and you will be prospered, and, and, and you, you will have success. So what we need to understand, see, I love it because, that, see, that's what this is. To remind us that there was the law. That's what that's about. That's the reason those are on there. It's a reminder to us. It isn't to look cute. It isn't, oh, look at us. Um, we're a little different, aren't we? <laughs> yes, we are. Oh, I like the guy with the beanie and the cape. No, no. It's to remind us. Everything is to point us back to the covenant. And that's what God has tried to do. And, and you see, that's the reason everybody got to looking at this thing of the law and saying, oh, the law, the law, the law, the law. That we're, we're, you know, we don't want it to be the law. Give it away from the law. And God is saying, look, boys and girls, I'm sorry, but I covenanted with my children. You want to be one of my children? You will covenant with me. And that's all there is to it. He said, I'm not going to break the covenant. Until you do, everything's going to come up roses. After you do, everything's going to come up a dingy looking brown. And we can't seem to understand. But if we can get into this and get deep enough into this and begin to realize there were certain ways in which they did this thing. Certain ways in which they begin to, to keep coming back and keep saying, look, okay, it's this and this. Now what are we doing right now in the fellowship? Right now in the fellowship, we're trying to get everybody to understand we must produce the fruit of the Spirit. We must understand the purpose of temptation. We must understand the festivals. We must understand Roshadish, which is new moon, which just came and went. And we must also, and foremost, understand Shabbat. Now once we begin to do those things so that you'll begin to realize that, that, that through these festivals, this is the gateway for us through the covenant to end back up in Israel. What is it about? It's to remember when. Why do you think God has, has got this thing about, about Sukkot or Sukkot? What do you think, what do you think that's about? Because we come out of our homes, we live in make, makeshift, uh, homes that's not nice as we live in for a week. What's that about? Because folks, when we all get over there, we might be living unless God intends for a while. Nobody knows. Okay? What's that about? Remember, 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 remember. They did it, we can do it. Did God bless them during that time? Yes, God blessed them during that time. Uh, nevertheless, they flattered Him with their mouth. Now, I'm, uh, let's see, 35. And they remember that God was their rock and the high God, their Redeemer. 36. Nevertheless, they did flatter Him with their mouth and they lied unto Him with their tongue. For their heart was not right with Him, neither were they steadfast in His covenant. Now, it didn't say they didn't keep the covenant, did they? Did it? It said that they weren't steadfast in the covenant. Well, we won't have time to do Shabbat this week. We did it last week. And I mean, God, pull the, pull, pull, pull the ox out of the ditch, let's go to the baseball game. I don't mean when your, your child happens to be playing the Little League either. I'm talking about out, out in our case, out in St. Louis to watch the Cardinals play this afternoon. Well, we'll catch it next week. Next week comes, we still don't do Shabbat. New moon comes, Rosh Hashanah, and we miss Rosh Hashanah. Now listen to me, that's where they were at. Now let's go back here, and let's understand this very clearly. It says, nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth. Oh, we love the festivals, we love new moon, we love Shabbat. Come on, that's what they were doing. Just what we're doing standing now in a lot of what's going on in what we call the Messianic movement. All right? They, and, and it said, For their heart was not right with him, neither, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgive their iniquity, 
and destroy them not. So see, you can be steadfast and not get destroyed. Somebody better say amen. Yet many, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back, tempted God, and limited the Holy One of Israel. So see, that's what happens. Now you can get, you can, you can mess around with this thing. And bless God, God will have some mercy about all of it, all right? But it's still not going to bring you the kind of blessings that you're looking for. They remembered not his hand nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy, how he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zon, and had turned their rivers into blood and their floods that, could, that, that, that they could not drink. He sent divers sorts of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs which destroyed them. Things weren't going well, were they? He gave also the increase unto the caterpillar and their labor unto the locusts. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore trees with frost. Well, we've had a little frost mess up with our, our fruit crop here this year. And he gave up their cattle also to hail and their flocks to hot uh, thunderbolts. He cast upon them fierceness of his, his anger, wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. Oh, ever heard of evil angels? You have now. That's all part of it. Now, 55. He cast out the heathen also before them and divided them an inheritance by line and made the tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents. Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not His testimonies, but turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow, for they provoked him to anger and their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. When God heard this, he was wrought and greatly abhorred Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among them. He delivered his strength into captivity and the glory into the enemy's hands. He gave his people over into, unto the sword and was wrought with his inheritance. He goes on down through here in 66, and he smote his enemies in the hinder parts. He put them to perpetual reproach. Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim. He chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. And he built his sanctuary like the, like the high places, like the earth, which he had established forever. He chose David as his servant and took him from the sheepfold from following the ewes great with youth and brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel and his heritage. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So the integrity of his heart. He said, I'll make the covenant. I'll never destroy the covenant. He said, you decide. He said, you, you, be, you be the one you be the one that's going to decide. He said, I don't want to get in the middle of something here that I don't need to be in the middle of. And that's really what God does. You know, maybe it's not such a wonderful idea. And maybe being God, it had to be. Why did He let us make all these choices? Why didn't He just say, okay, boys and girls, this is the way it's going to be, and that's the way it would have been. Wouldn't this have been easier for you and I? Yeah. But He gave us choice. And what we want to do in this seminar this weekend is to get you to consider choices that you have once made in relationship to the choices in which God gave us that maybe we forgot. 